way. So kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, welcome to this presentation on a public health approach to road safety. Um, look, a huge thank you to our presenter today, Alistair Woodward of the University of Auckland for taking time out of his schedule to deliver this presentation to the people that are attending in Auckland and uh, for everyone online. Special thanks to our committee members, uh, Hamish Mackey of Mackey Research and Consulting for coordinating this presentation and for Sam Palsy of WSP for uh, organising the venue to host this in person in Auckland. Uh, for people that are online, uh, if you do have any questions uh, as the presentation goes, please pop them in the Q&A. Please use the Q&A panel uh, at the bottom of the Zoom invitation there rather than the chat. Uh, and I will um, moderate those and pose the questions that have been asked to Alistair at the conclusion of his presentation. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Hamish, who will introduce um, Alistair, and then we'll get underway. Well, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Hamish Mackey toku um, I'm Hamish Mackey, and as uh, Paul has mentioned, I'm a recent addition to the um, the um, Australasian College of Road Safety, the New Zealand chapter, and the committee um, for it. And we've decided it would be a good idea to, um, as we start to you know, continue to focus on deaths and serious injuries, building on the road safety strategies that we have and all the good work that's been done, that it's a good time to also focus on the, the broader things that we've got so we can have a slightly more uh, holistic view of road safety. And this is quite important considering uh, some of the challenges we have at the moment uh, with, with COVID-19 uh, and, and other challenges, the emissions reduction plan, lots of things we have to be thinking about at the same time as reducing those deaths and serious injuries. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Alistair Woodward, and I'm just going to introduce him now. Uh, Alistair is a, is a public health doctor and epidemiologist, presently a professor in the School of Population Health at the University of Auckland. His first job after completing his uh, master's of public health was at the accident, sorry, the road accident research unit at the University of Adelaide. Since then, he has worked in universities around the world on environmental health issues, including air pollution, climate change, and radiation risks. Presently, he's involved in studies of climate impacts in China and the Pacific, the effects of changing streets in South Auckland, and the future of the bicycle. So without further ado, thank you, Alistair. Thank you, thank you very much, Hamish. Um, so it's sort of complicated. I'm talking to you in the room here. I'm talking to everybody who's online, uh, and I'm also trying to keep track of what's on the screen. Um, but uh, I look forward to your discussions, uh, to the discussion. I look forward very much to questions, um, and I hope you find this of interest. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I, I called this a public health approach to road safety, but it struck me that public health is already embedded in road safety. You know, it's a question of perhaps whether it, there are some advantages to uh, a stronger injection of public health to road safety. I, I was reminded of that when I um, thought about my own entrance to this field. As Hamish said, my first job after I did my MPH was with the Road Accident Research Unit at the University of Adelaide. And I was working with Jack McLean, who's sort of the guy standing on top of the car there. Um, I don't know whether any of you know him or knew him. He retired from the job about 10 years ago. And Tony Ryan, who's directly below him, who also an engineer, Jack was a, a civil engineer. Um, and uh, Tony, I think, was civil. Anyway, he ended up working in Monash for many years as a, in, in the um, in crash accident research unit. <clears throat> now, Jack, um, uh, uh, after this photo was taken, went to Harvard where he did a PhD and his PhD was in epidemiology and biostatistics. Then he came back as the director of the road accident research unit a and his heart was in engineering approaches to road safety. So lots of in-depth investigations of accidents. 
and he loved the laboratory where he could make things crash together and put in dummies and see what happened and so on. But he also um, saw the benefits and advantages of, uh, of epidemiology. And so often there were epidemiological studies linked to his in-depth um, crash studies. And this was one that I was involved in looking at speed, you know, so a case control study where the cases came from the in-depth investigations and my job was to go out and collect control observations. Um, the findings of no surprise to you, of course, but quite important all the same. Um, and maybe Jack's stronger, greatest um, piece of work, I think, his real legacy was the work he did on alcohol, where similarly um, there were uh, control measures of breath alcohol levels and drivers passing sites at which serious accidents occurred. And on that basis, really, the um, argument was made for a, a, a breath limit of 0.08. <clears throat> so um, possible advantages of boosting public health elements. I, I want to talk about two things. One is um, the idea of stretching the boundaries of road safety. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about that, but I can see some advantages to thinking not just about injury on the road, but other elements of health and safety. And secondly, um, are there things that we might be able to learn from successful public health initiatives elsewhere that could be applied to road safety? <clears throat> now, I, I, um, I think that we might have something to learn from thinking about the history of the workplace. To begin with, um, all the work on hazards in the workplace was associated with injury. Um, but then it was events like this, the Hawk's Nest incident, so-called, um, from the Appalachians in 1931, when Union Carbide, a company with a poor record in uh, occupational health and safety and environmental matters generally, bored a tunnel straight through a mountain that, as it turned out, was pure sandstone. And... Um, the silica dust levels were extraordinarily high. There was no protection provided for the workers who were mainly black men. Um, and we don't know how many people died, but somewhere probably of the order of 600 to 800 of the 2,000 men who worked in the tunnel died from acute silicosis within a year. And it was this experience and others that sort of made the point that we were thinking about occupational safety, as it was called in the US at the moment, at the time, would it make more sense to think of occupational safety and health, um, considering the other hazards associated with work? Uh, and of course, you know, the relevant uh, um, body in the United States is called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. <clears throat> so, you know, with a similar sort of approach in mind, this is a picture I show students. Um, and you would, this is Lake Road, Takapuna, many of you would know this uh, venue very well, I'm sure. And I say to them, well, have a look at this picture and just tell me what kinds of hazards you can see in this picture. Uh, and, you know, we could do that exercise here, of course, but um, it's interesting what shows up so that, of course, injury is one of the issues. But here are some of the others, noise, not very sociable, one of the students said. Difficulty exercising, you can see that there's a brave cyclist in the cycle lane up the top there. COVID risk, uh, people were talking about public transport. Um, mental stress, air pollution and climate change are just some of the things that um, people bring up and talk about what are the hazards to health on the road. Um, and certainly injury is one of them, but there are others. <clears throat> this is, I, a, um, a study that um, Ed Randall's PhD student did earlier in the year or published earlier in the year that I was associated with that tried to put some numbers on these um, other effects of um, transport systems on health. A and it was a bit of a thought experiment. We said if, you know, you imagine that the New Zealand population alive in 2011 had no exposure to air pollution from transport, no road traffic injuries, and achieved at least the recommended weekly amount of physical activity through walking and cycling, 
from 2011 onwards? What difference would it make to the, their health over a lifetime? And this is what we worked out, that roughly a million health-adjusted life years, $8 billion saved from the health system over the lifetime of this cohort. Big numbers, it's hard to make sense of them, but they're roughly what you would expect to see from tobacco and obesity over that same period. Um, we were interested in the equity issues, and uh, we found that Māori would gain more healthy years per capita than non-Māori, so um, health, the transport system is a cause of health inequity. Um, overall, physical activity dominates these figures, but it's interesting that road crash injury is a really important cause of inequity if you look at the you know, the rates for Māori men, they are extraordinarily high by comparison with non-Māori. <clears throat> now, this is probably an underestimate. And the reason for that is that the, the, um, the health impacts of traffic-related air pollution have recently been revised. And you may know of this work, the Health and Air Pollution in New Zealand, the third version of this assessment, which was... Um, published last month. Um, Gerda Kershaw led it. I was involved with it. For the very first time, we had good measures of NO2. Um, and that really changes the picture. You know, it goes from sort of 1,000 deaths a year to about 3,000 deaths a year. And as you can see, and as you would expect, knowing about where NO2 comes from, the contribution of um, vehicle pollution is increased enormously. And so um, the bulk of those deaths, the bulk of those costs um, are related to motor vehicles. Just one way of bringing that to life, perhaps, um, Hamish mentioned the Transport Emissions Reduction Plan for Auckland, which was signed off by council yesterday, was that right, or the day before, or just only a few days ago. Anyway, which is these, you know, remarkably ambitious goals, including halving um, VKT uh, in a relatively short space of time. I just did rough arithmetic. You know, if we halve transport pollution in Auckland, that would save about 380 premature deaths a year. So that's, you know, that's a really sizable impact, isn't it? Another way of thinking about health and safety on the road um, is to think about the positive aspects. And our colleague, Kirsty Wilde, did a really nice study looking at the effects of low traffic neighborhoods in 2020 with the first COVID lockdown. <clears throat> and um, this was a qualitative study. There are no numbers associated with it, but her finding was that the effects were quite profound, really, in terms of the way people used the streets, the way they felt about their neighborhoods, the way they moved around. And all these benefits, you know, as well as being good for dealing with COVID, um, social resilience, climate action, health gain were all positive aspects of, of um, taking cars out of neighbourhoods. So, so that's the first bit of my pitch that I think um, that there would it would make some sense, and there would certainly be you know advantages in my view. Um, to thinking about safety on the road in broader terms than just injury. Injury is terribly important. We can't lose sight of it. But there are, are these other health impacts of transport systems that are important as well. And, and then the second um, uh, argument I want to make is that it's possible that perhaps we could learn from successful public health initiatives elsewhere. Now, I'm just going to go off camera for a minute, but I promise I'll be back. <laughs> and um, what I'd like you to do is to film what this is. Well, it's cigarette. Cigarette. Um, ashtray. Ashtray, yeah. Ashtray, ashtray. Yeah. ashtray <laughs> from the School of Medicine. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. it's an ashtray that's a very special ashtray. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I could just hold it up here, you might be able to see it. So uh, the, the, the point is that when the new medical school at University of Auckland started up, they needed desks, they needed blackboards, as they were in those times, not whiteboards, but blackboards. Um, and, and they needed ashtrays, you know. So um, it's, it's such a lovely, you know, piece of 
<laughs> kit, isn't it? You know, with the, the crest and so on. <clears throat> it, just a reminder of um, how embedded tobacco use was in day to day life, you know, and, and this is less than 50 years ago, you know. Um, uh, and, and how much things have changed, you know. I, I, I tried to do that trick with one of, again, it's my undergraduate students, and I showed them this. Um, and the young woman I asked to describe it must have been, been all of 19. And she looked at it in bewilderment and said, it's a container of some kind. <laughs> you know, so we've got generations um, coming up who've never seen an ashtray. Um, so I, I think um, what, uh, what happened in tobacco control has been profound. And it, it's interesting to reflect on um, how it happened that we were able to bring about such an enormous change. The first point to make um, is that it wasn't easy. You know, so I was involved very much in the um, smoke-free environments work um, in the 1990s. Um, and there were people frothing at the mouth about this suggestion, you know, and finally a smoke-free environment. You know, the, the idea was that it would, the sky would fall in, you know, basically. Um, and so I thought these three features of tobacco control in particular, but it, they were certainly evident in the smoke-free environments um, campaign are, are relevant and worth reflecting on. The first point, you know, we went upstream. So it wasn't a case of relying, as they still do in Japan, on education of individual smokers to behave courteously. You know, don't take notice of people around you, don't smoke, uh, blow, don't blow your smoke in the direction of people because they might annoy them. So um, it, it was an upstream. Let's look at making public places and workplaces smoke-free entirely. You know. It was large scale. So um, it wasn't a case of going to the pub at, you know, Hamish's favorite pub at, um, at uh, St. Helier's and saying, well, what would you think about going smoke free? And then you go down to Mission Bay and talk to the public in there, you know, to see whether he'd be okay about it. Um, th this was uh, consulted nationally um, and implemented nationally. Um, and action oriented. So I would just want to talk a little bit about that, about the aspects of the, it being action oriented. Um, one thing was that um, that question about, uh, well, there were two questions that politicians asked, and those of working in the area were very sensitive to what was on the politician's mind. One was, is this a trivial issue? So they wanted to know how big was the health problem? So I, I won't show you that work, but that was work that we did. And secondly, is this gonna cost a bomb? You know, is this really going to have serious impacts on business? So this was work that we did um, looking at the implementation of the smoking bans. Um, and you can see winter and spring 2004, that was before the ban came in, winter and spring 2005, was, which was after the ban was came in. And, um, and what do you notice from that table? Smoke drop in business. <laughs> 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 business is the same cigarettes down yeah yeah so i mean the, the bottom row was, was sort of the important one people yeah. said will anybody take notice of this Do, will you need a policeman at the, at the door of every pub you know in fact as you can see it was self-enforcing but the other point about the sky falling in for business was not true you know the, the, in fact there was no discernible change in um in, in business. And this was very important um, because the other thing, another thing about the Smoke Free Environments Act was that it was led by a very brave politician by the name of Helen Clark. Um, and you have a look back when the, um, when the, when the comprehensive legislation was first proposed, um, majority of New Zealanders opposed it. At the time it um, was passed, it was very even in terms of popular support. And then very rapidly, 
um, it uh, became, you know, the, the support rose, the opposition fell away once people had the experience of what it was like. A and so th this was an example of, you know, leadership in my mind, having a vision of where we want to go. And a good example of a point that's relevant, I think, to transport generally, that it's hard for people to judge the merits of a change until they have an opportunity to experience it. Looking at um, tobacco more broadly, um, Simon Chapman is, was, is an Australian um, public health person who's very much involved with tobacco control. And he wrote this great book called Public Health Advocacy and Tobacco Control. Uh, he, he suggested that these items, these, this is my wording, it's not the way he described it, but these four things were key. Um, and this is sort of getting to the action-oriented part of public health, I think. News making is key. So um, finding ways of capturing people's attention and communicating with them um, in, a, in a meaningful way is really important. Get close to politicians so at least you know what's on their mind and how they see things. Challenge norms. So it, it's, again, it's hard to imagine now, but there was this social norm that smoking was glamorous, um, smoking was a sign of success, smoking um, was a feature of people who were in control. Um, and one of the responses of the tobacco movement, this was the advocacy side of things, I suppose, was to very much challenge those norms. And you can see the example of this billboard, um, which originally said Peter Jackson 30s, you're laughing. That was the, the um that, that was the, that was the, the 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 catchphrase that they used. <clears throat> and, and does anybody know what bugger up stands for? <laughs> well, it was Simon and his mates, and, and they were billboard utilizing graffiti artists against unhealthy products. <laughs> they, they, they had enormous impact, you know, far more impact than all the scientific papers that I wrote, you know, Simon and the people out with spray cans. <clears throat> and then the, the last point, um, I'd be very interested in your comments on this. Um, in the tobacco area, um, this is Simon's words, there was no progress without vector control. Um, who were the vectors? What was the vector, do you think, in this instance? It was the tobacco industry. Uh, and so the argument was that we couldn't be blind, um, we must not be blind to the activities of the industry that profits from this particular product. Um, and, and of course, the tobacco industry played very dirty, you know, um, and it, I, I was in the receiving line because I was chair of an advisory group for the NHMRC on passive smoking, and they took us to the federal court, you know, and, um, and uh, in Australia on the grounds that we were not paying due attention to their submissions. Very clever, huge sums of money. We were just overwhelmed, you know, by what they were able to do, and they, they won the case, actually. Um, Naomi Oreskes, you know, wrote a great book on this topic, and she said Big Tobacco was the first industrial merchant of doubt, but not the last. Um, so um, I think that that is something to bear in mind. The imperatives and direction of business are um, important in road safety as well. Maybe we could talk about this in the discussion, but here's just something that you may have noticed in the same month that the National Emission Reduction Plan came out, which was June, um, in which is talking about a more than 40% cut in transport emissions by 2035. So that's only just over 10 years away. Um, in the same month, Ford brought out its new Ranger, you know, um, and the 2022 flight fleet is bigger, more powerful, and more polluting than any fleet previously. 
Um, and the Ranger, as you know, is the top or has been the top selling light vehicle in New Zealand. So is there a problem here? Is there a problem? <clears throat> I, I, um, I started off by reference to the Road Accident Research Unit. So I, I, um, I just wanted to finish second to last slide, this one, um, with um, reference to some of the great work they've been doing recently. So this comes from the unit. It's changed its my name, but it's in the same place. Um, looking at uh, the effects of mass and vehicle design on um, crash outcome. So it's two vehicle crashes in New South Wales over a 10 year period. <clears throat> and um, looking at the, uh, the risk of uh, fatal or serious injury um, in, the heavy, in the lighter vehicle compared with the heavier vehicle. So it's a, it's a ratio. Um, and you can see, as you might expect, as the difference in masses of the two vehicles increases, the, um, the risk ratio increases as well. So the person in the lighter vehicle is at a greater risk if they run into, if they run into a, a much heavier vehicle. But the second point, and the really important point, is that there is a design effect over and above that. Um, so two reasons why light trucks are hazardous. It's the, the mass and the rigidity and the other design features. So <clears throat> the question of what to do about light trucks in the city um, and how we treat the, the tension between um, big companies like Ford that see their commercial success as being threatened by rapid decarbonisation um, and the obvious interests that we have both in terms of climate and in terms of road safety, um, that, that's a real challenge for us. So that, that's where I would like to leave it. Uh, and this is hopefully provoking some discussion. Um, is this history relevant to road safety? And to remind you what um, Simon Chapman suggested was key to making progress on tobacco, news making, get close to politicians, challenge norms, no progress without vector control. Is this, uh, is this, this something that we should be thinking in the, about in the road safety space as well? Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, there, Alistair. That great presentation. What we're going to do now is uh, we'll take any questions um, from the attendees who are based in Auckland. So if Sam or Hamish could coordinate any of those. Just a reminder to people that are online, if you do wish to pose a question to Alistair, please pop it in the Q&A chat um, and I will put those to Alistair. All right, so um, I'll, I'll hand back to the, the room. Hi. Hello. Uh, grateful to look backwards to, uh, to see the future. Um, I'm an electrosensitive person, so coming to this room is actually making me ill. I'm worried in the future that um, with the driverless cars, the, the amount of radiation, as you were expert on, so I thought I'd be good back there, on the road. Um, I really have to avoid most, but I can't go into lecture theatres at the university, public libraries, community centres, it all go off Wi Fi on um, steroids. Um, and I'm also uh, troubled by uh, lighting. Will the roads become quite an electromagnetic suit in the future? I, I don't know whether people online heard that question, but it was about um, the consequences of moving to um, driverless cars and yeah. the uh, effect that might have on the uh, electromagnetic uh, environment, the, the, the amount of electromagnetic radiation, possibly the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. Um, I don't know um, the answer to that. I, I think my own position on driverless cars is that there, at this stage, it looks as though there are other problems that probably will, you know, slow down their introduction. Um, it, there is already a very rich, you know, I mean, electromagnetic radiation is something we're bathed in at the moment, inside and outside. Oh, <laughs> um, if you look at the 
in density, particularly in places like Auckland or cell phone repeater stations and so on. Um, I, 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 I respect your, you know, your comments about um, being particularly sensitive to this. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time trying to find evidence of significant health effects in the general population and have not found that that's the case. So I, it's no, 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 it's it's by no means a closed book, but there are I, schools as well. Most schools in France, Germany, and Sweden, yeah, don't have Wi Fi. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, the point about Wi Fi in schools, I think there are excellent reasons for moderating the amount of Wi Fi in schools, apart from you know the electromagnetic effects, I think the distraction effects, the um social media exposure that kids get. I, I think there are, you know, there's a host of issues in there, isn't there? Um, uh, the driverless cars thing, I'm not quite so sure. Um, Shashi, can you come again? Um, thank you. Okay. Um, that was very good. And, um, sorry. Um, you showed a very interesting slide on the lake road. Yeah. That was quite, um, Interesting. Uh, so, because I work in road safety, so I know that particular very well. But you also had a text there, mental stress. Is there any way we can measure mental stress? Because as part of I mean, we are engineers, we keep doing safety intervention all the time. So, mental stress is something we kind of ignore. Or yes. No, no thank you. Thank you. So, the question was about the effects of um, traffic on mental health is that right yeah well um i i would agree with you that's an area that's been overlooked in the past measurement of mental stress is not straightforward um there are ways of trying to get at it through for example um measures of conductivity on the skin you know when the autonomic system fires up you get a bit of sweating and so the conductivity changes in the skin and um, pulses, pulse rate tends to go up, you know. So people have put effort and time into looking at those acute responses. Um, but there's also been quite a lot of work done looking at the sort of long-term and cumulative effects and also quite a bit of qualitative research done just listening to people tell stories about what their day-to-day -day life is like. I mentioned Kirsty Wilde, she's a sociologist who's been working with Hamish and I, um, and this was a particular interest of hers. Um, and, and so, for example, it appears that the mental stress of commuting is quite time dependent. People will put up with most conditions for about 20 minutes. But if your commute is 40 minutes or more, then people do find it really knocks the stuffing out of them. Um, and uh, drawing on a whole wealth of information, Kirsty asked the question, who are the happiest commuters, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the answer is not car drivers, you know, they consistently mm -hmm. rate towards the bottom. Um, cyclists, in fact, have the highest happiest happiness scores, and it's to do with things like arrival time reliability, so a lot of people said you know, I don't mind that it, maybe it'll take me an extra 10 or 15 minutes on my bike. I just know that I'm going to get there, you know, rather on your car, you just don't mind and what's what's going to happen. The um, physical activity you know, associated with um, cycling is good for mood. Um, and um, the sort of contact with the city, you get to know it, you're not enclosed in a metal box. So I... I think the mental health aspects of transport are really important and um, certainly something that we should look more closely at. I could just add as a cyclist, I've developed species today. From cycling? Yeah. 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 yeah quite serious. Oh, that's so good. Just go to the next one. Yeah. Um, their photo outside, check the grammar, actually. This is a very photo because I've mentioned it in the grammar. All right. Uh, also, Kevin has mentioned Three five years on that, <laughs> but um, the question I had was uh, the sort of political pushback I guess that we've seen around like the accessible streets and the consultation that's gone out for making safe 
control zones, the mm. schools, and that sort of thing. Uh, do you think in 10 years' time we will talk back in the same way that it was a much paper that um, you just might be able to smoke and sort of change? Is it going to just be how do we sort of be kind of controlled? Is it quite bothered by um, the site or the sort of yeah, yeah. So, so the question is: um, In ten or fifteen years' time, will we look back on things like car parking arrangements um, in the same way that we now look back on, you know, smoke at the university, people smoking in lecture theatres and offices uh, or in pubs? Um, I, I, I'm I tend towards an optimistic view. I think I think that will happen. Um, but maybe in some ways it's a, it's a more difficult transition because, you know, cars, we live in a very car dominated transport environment. And so it's a big shift for people. Um, and um, how to make that shift is something we're still working out, I think. It's quite interesting with this safety, especially like kids' safety, because it's amazing that you saw it. Yeah, well, I, again, I'd be interested in comments with people online and people in this room, but um, I, I, I wonder whether it's partly like the smoke-free environments that people's attitudes changed quite a bit once they got to experience it. Uh, I was recently in London, um, and it, had been, it was the first time I'd been there in 10 years, and the center of the city has just been transformed by the road pricing you know so the tr traffic levels are way down there's no parking on arterial roads you know the sorts of things that we're still battling with here um and, and uh the environment is so pleasant <laughs> alistair we have uh, some great questions coming through online so i might uh, go to some of those now if if that's okay with you Sure. Um, so one question is, if we treat motor vehicles as a workplace, then there would be um, a major shift in driving attitudes and consequently safety. However, WorkSafe uh, seems to have shied away from this. What can be done to remedy this glaring issue? Oh, that's a really good question, um, Paul. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I mean, there has been discussion about... Um, legislation analogous to you know health and safety in the workplace um, that would extend similar sorts of provisions to responsibility liability monitoring you know at present of course if there's an accident a crash on on the road and somebody's seriously injured um, it's very difficult to find out you know just who's responsible and it's certainly not necessarily the um, agencies responsible for building and maintaining the roads, which is just such a different sort of mindset to the approach to injury in the workplace. Um, some people think that perhaps we could tweak the current workplace legislation to extend the responsibility um, for the road. And what you've just suggested is one way of doing that, perhaps. Um, or do we need new provisions altogether? I don't know the answer to that, but it is such a glaring um, inconsistency, isn't it? It's not just the difference between transport and um, road, the transport and uh, the workplace. It's differences within the transport sector between different kinds of transport. You know, absolutely. So, <clears throat> aviation, rail. Um, uh, maritime um, transport or maritime set setting that they are much closer to the workplace model where there are clear responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, uh, just just related to that. Um, sorry, uh, what Tahi does have a, a work program in Road to Zero, which is about working in and around vehicles, which is quite broad, and that involves people, um, you know, using public transport and, and road workers and truck drivers and things and. And then WorkSafe also has a program. Um, uh, uh, no, sorry, that's working in and around vehicles. And, and what Tahi also has a work related road safety program. So, I mean, it has been worked on, but, but possibly it's not as well established as other parts of road safety. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So, sort of great question. I can't give you a crisp answer. No, that's fine. Look, I think that's uh, generated a, um, a, a great. Uh, a thought-provoking uh, response. It was a great question that came in as well. Um, another one here that we've got is in regard to the uptake in working from home. So generated some positive impacts in terms of road safety, perhaps some less pollution because people are traveling less. But what about um, any offset and negative impacts like potentially a reduction in health impacts or health effects? Overall, do you see the uptake in working from home as a good thing, a neutral thing, or a negative thing? Yeah, well, again, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this, and I would be interested in other people's point of view. I, I think it's partly how it's implemented. I mean, there are, there are many people for whom it's not really possible to work at home. You know? um, and uh, what provisions have we made for them? Uh, if, you know, the idea is that offices close down or are made far less welcoming or less accessible. Um, <clears throat> there, there's another question that's been raised about um, uh, uh, about displacement behaviour. You know, do people who work from home two or three days a week actually reduce their amount of driving overall? It's not at all clear that they do, actually. Um, so uh, I, I think there is still, you know, still an open question, really. I, I mean, I think it's undoubtedly happening and it probably will persist, uh, you know, the change in thinking about uh, offices and workplaces and the move to, um, to spending more time at home has lots of advantages, potentially. But, and I, I think the question, oh, sure. uh, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned, uh, and I wrote down a quote that you gave, Alistair, which said it's hard for people to judge the merits of a proposed change until they've had the chance to experience it. And I think working from home is a little bit like that as well. People may have had uh, all sorts of preconceived opinions about it prior to um, it effectively being enforced on a large proportion of the workforce with uh, COVID lockdowns and the like. And now I would suggest that a uh, similar change in sentiment uh, to that question would have occurred if it was compared to uh, what the sentiment would have been had it been asked prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. I'll go on to another one question, uh, question here, just relates to the, I guess, the uptake in um, light trucks and utes in the vehicle fleet. Like obviously, some of them are used for trades and for farming, and it's necessary for business use. But do you know if there's any statistics around the proportion used, uh, not used in business? So I guess discretionary uh, vehicles uh, replacing, say, a traditional uh, car, sedan, SUV type thing. Um, and what could we do to discourage the uptake of um, uh, those size of vehicles for non-business use? So two two questions there, good ones, about mm. you know, do we know about um, how utes are used and uh, what could be done to um, discourage their use where it seems inappropriate and harmful? Yes, is the answer to the first question. Um, we... I offer you two bits of information. One comes from informal roadside surveys around Auckland where I got students to count utes going past and to note whether they were towing anything and whether they were carrying anything and whether they had business markings on them. <clears throat> and um, of course, none of them were off-road because <laughs> it was all, all the all the measures were taken on Auckland streets. There are lots of utes in Auckland, as you'd know, and other major cities in New Zealand. Um, uh, I think it was 10% was towing and 15% um, was carrying and 20% had some evidence of it being a business vehicle. Mm -hmm. We're looking into it more closely with the Household Travel Survey, which um, does you know, contain quite fine-grained information about travel people make and how they get around. It's not published yet, but um, our, our finding is that um, most uh, trips by ute uh, in the city are short distances and they're exactly the kind of trips that are made by people in cars. Mm. So, you yeah. know, they're, they're substituting for, for cars. 
um, whether that's a good thing or not is another issue. I happen to think it's not a good thing. Um, and uh, the question of what to do about it, yeah, that's mm. an interesting one, isn't it? Um, uh, I, I, I don't fully know the answer to that. One is trying to include the cost of externalities in the cost of the purchase. To some extent, the government's already done that with its clean, air, clean car um, uh, tax mm. or um, benefit, they don't call it a tax, charge. Um, we did some work with the Happens you know, findings because most utes are diesel and because they're big and heavy and have big engines. The social cost per kilometer of driving a ute is about five or six Ooh. times that of driving a light petrol car. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah it's quite extensive, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. So, so one response is to say, well, you can buy a ute, but you've got to pay the full price, you know. And um, and that would be quite a bit more than people are paying at the moment because they get those those benefits. The the other thing, and another way of thinking about it is on the supply side. I mean, New Zealand is pretty unusual, isn't it? We don't have a local manufacturing industry. Everything comes in on those big car carriers down at the port, um, and so it would be within um, the capacity for New Zealand to very simply say, as of whatever period we will not accept these vehicles into New Zealand mm -hmm. or they will be accepted, but only under very specific conditions. You know, maybe it'll, we'll treat a double cab ute like a, um, uh, a combine harvester, you know. Right. <laughs> you, can use it. You, you can use it where it's needed, but yes. you don't park it, you know, in Ponsonby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alice. I've still got some more questions, if that's okay. Just mindful of time. We've got about 10 minutes to go before we'll um, close off the webinar. And um, there's a couple here that I would still like to get through. So this one's a little bit off topic, and you may not have an answer to it. But um, is, have you been involved in any research or aware of any research regarding the impact of transportation on suicide attempts or prevention? Just in that, I guess, no, the question was perhaps framed around the mental illness or the, the mental health component of transportation. Oh, no, look, I'm sorry, I, I haven't. But mm -hmm. indirectly, um, I, I know that um, there's a, a very strong relationship between physical activity and depression mm -hmm. and, and fairly good evidence that habitual use of active transport is associated with better mood. Uh, mm -hmm lower incidence of depression and, and and so you might stretch that to say perhaps that has an effect on suicide but i i don't know whether that's been demonstrated sure okay thank you for that um this one's just come in um and i think it's particularly pertinent to the conversation and that is that social license has been put up as a, a reason why we should be maybe a bit less ambitious on our road safety interventions, and we should wouldn't shouldn't really be proceeding until we have the social license. But that would seem to be a little bit contradictory to the smoking example that you gave before, where uh, those in favour were the minority in the first instance, and that opinion changed over time. So the question is: in a political environment where opinion polls are king, how can we convince our political leaders to take a leap of faith on road safety interventions? Yeah, that's. I reckon that's the sixty-four dollar question, really, mm -hmm. you know, for us in New Zealand at the moment. Um, how, how do we plan long term? You know, it's, it's important for road safety. It's important for many other things as well. Um, I, I think there are structural issues with road transport that make it difficult. You know, the, the fact that um, we tend to consult block by block rather than looking at the big picture. Sure, you've got to give everybody their say, but then the smoking example was you proceed, you know, mm -hmm. at a national scale, um, and 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 it just things get so bogged down when you know it's a question of what are the safety, how many pedestrian crossings do we have at St Heliers, you know, mm -hmm. then where do we put the pedestrian crossings at Mission Bay and bike lanes, you know, Island Bay and Wellington. Um, so I, I think that there are questions about the way we consult, the way we organize things. I know that that's changing, the government's proposing 
there be significant changes in the way that decisions are taken about transport. I just think my sense is that that's probably quite important yes. in order to proceed, as your question suggests. I don't know. I'd be interested. Hamish knows a lot about this, and others maybe in the room could comment. It's, yeah, well, it's, it's Go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no problem. <laughs> uh, oh, if you yeah, come up with that, fun. Hamish, uh, we'll come back Sorry, to you just, later. Yeah, just or just one, just one thing on that. Um, I, I think one thing we are seeing, and as a bit of a trend, is, is a move to the direction that um, Alice is talking about. Um, it is encouraging. I think some of the ways in which engagement happens that uh, organisations like Auckland Transport, Waka Katahi, are starting to take um, to move through some of these. Uh, issues, you know, whether it's working with a, a particular stakeholder group quite closely and working through it and, and not having these public sort of, uh, you know, fruit throwing sessions at, at people um, and, uh, and, and and thinking, you know, in a much bigger scale, for example, like the setting of speed limits work that's happening. Um, so mm -hmm. I think personally, they're encouraging signs at least. Yeah. Okay, the next one is really just a comment, um, noting that Waka Kotahi do ask questions uh, within their regular state highway customer experience survey about how people feel on their journeys and why they feel those things. So uh, that was useful. Uh, the other one was, uh, do you know what the impact or the effect of compulsory motor vehicle insurance might be on safety? So for instance, that, does it help address recidivist behaviours or would it help? <clears throat> I, I think that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, having lived and worked in Australia for quite a long time, sort of aware of that difference, that interesting difference between Australia and New Zealand in terms of compulsory, you know, insurance. Um, to what extent it uh, flows through into driver behaviour and the frequency of crashes and the effects on injury, I, I really don't know. Mm. Maybe okay. others could comment on that. No. I'll, I'll go to the uh, the last couple of questions just uh, uh, with time of the essence. So um, just wondering if you had a view on the uh, perhaps inconsistent message being sent to children regarding seatbelts when, when you travel in a private or a light vehicle, they're required to use seatbelts. Um, but when they're on a school trip, there may be a vehicle that they're traveling in where no seatbelts are provided. Um, so are so from a child's point of view, what do they make of seatbelts and their importance? And if so, why are schools or Ministry of Education putting uh, children in that situation? I, I can't answer that. I, I, I mean, I, th I think in general, the experience of seatbelts is a very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like the smoking story in that when they were first proposed, I can still remember that in the 70s. Um, again, there was enormous resistance to it. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about people driving more dangerously if they have a seatbelt on and so on. But nowadays, I, I think for most people, putting a seatbelt on is like cleaning your teeth, brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, It's just a, a natural part of the day and it feels odd if you can't. Um, I would agree that uh, if children are you know, being exposed to that sort of inconsistent message, that's not helpful. Yeah, look, I would agree. Um, and the last question I have uh, received is in relation to the, the mass and rigidity, um, uh, increasing the risk for vehicles. So uh, more of a comment, presumably the vehicle height or the height of the front bumper is a large part of that um, risk relationship. And it goes on to ask a question of, have there been any successful examples of where the use of four-wheel drives or large utes has been restricted or discouraged in any way, anywhere? Yes, is the answer to that. I, you know, I said I was in London recently. The reason was I'd gone to Germany, actually, for my son's wedding and spent a month in Germany. And um, I presume Germany has tradesmen. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but I didn't see a single you know, double cab ute the whole time I was in Germany. So, and, and that's a result of, um, of deliberate policy. So there are plenty of vans, including many electric vans, which are used instead. Um, and 
uh, the, the light truck phenomenon, which is a real American phenomenon, it's not taken hold in Europe. Um, and that's, you know, that's not accidental. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Look, that's all the questions that I've received online. So um, uh, we, we're nearly at the end of our hour. Um, thank you very much on behalf of everyone online for your um, presentation, taking your time uh, to share with us uh, your learnings and your perspective about um, uh, the broader health implications of a transport system and challenging us to think beyond injuries uh, when we do our, our work in the road safety space. So yeah, on behalf of everyone online, thank you very much. And uh, I will um, leave you to have further conversations with the people in the Auckland office there. And thank you again to uh, Sam and Hamish for organising the event um, and for our speaker, Alistair. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.